Here's a question me and my historic friends have been arguing about for a very long time. And that is, why did Custer really fail at the Little Bighorn fight? Now, of course, if you've read contemporary musing on this, you know that he was a psychopath and he was an egomaniac and a nut job and that he wanted to be president of the United States. And that's why he attacked that village in Montana. And there's no redeeming uh, value. He was he was uh, just an absolute loser. Well, of course, that's not true. Uh, the guy had many, many attributes. He all, a lot of people believe he saved the United States at the Battle of Gettysburg, not once, but three times. So the guy had some, um, he had some chops and he was actually a pretty good officer. Now, um, in the 1960s, I remember hearing that um, the Custer Battlefield, as it was known at that time, would have these uh, West Point ride-alongs and they would bring out uh, classes of uh, soldiers to study the, the battlefield. And they would go on these horseback rides across the actual ground that Custer went on on that fateful day in 1876. And so um, they would stop and they would ask the uh, cadets and the uh, professors, uh, here's what Custer knew at the time and here's what he did. And I distinctly remember that the conclusion was that these soldiers agreed with every decision that he made. And so that was kind of like, uh, this was in the 60s, and so that was like jarring because we were starting to believe that, uh, you know, he, he had made a, a ton of mistakes. Okay, it's complicated, and there are kind of some weird areas here. The answers go back and forth, but I'll try to explain how all of the right moves led to the disastrous outcome. Here are the questions that we need answers for, and here they are. What is the real reason that Custer failed? Number two. Why were the Indians better armed, or were they? Number three, was there really a white man dressed as an Indian fighting on the Indian side? And number four, why were the Indians so hard to spot during the battle? Now, um, I went to my good friend, Paul Andrew Hutton, who's been studying this fight his whole life, and I was telling him about that West Point ride-along and how all the armchair generals and cadets uh, agreed with Custer's move, and would he please weigh in on that? Well, here's what he told me, and I think it's uh, very insightful. Basically, yes, Custer was going by the book, but he was always brash, and he split his command with this key failure. He split his command without knowing how big the Indian village was. And we know now that it was uh, probably one of the largest encampments in the history of, of Western warfare at, at the very least. So 10,000 people were there. Uh, but it had, always, it had always served him well to be brash. That's how he saved the United States at Gettysburg, because he didn't wait for orders. He didn't. He just went ahead. Now, it compounded uh, this decision when he split his command and had Reno attack the village while he went around to find another river crossing because uh, he was making this up on the fly and he assumed that his subordinates would support him. And if you know about the fight at all, you know that Reno ran into a buzzsaw and was uh, repulsed and gone back to the river and they were in total uh, disarray and fighting for their lives. And uh, Custer didn't know any of this, but now he's flying blind and he tries to go up and cross uh, the river. Now, um, the, uh, his subordinates, as I said, they let him down at every turn. As a matter of fact, at the subsequent hearing about the debacle and what happened, both uh, Reno and Bantine testified that they never heard any shooting downstream where uh, Custer was, and everyone else who testified under them uh, said that they could hear it and they did nothing. And so that uh, uh, was, was a huge, huge step compounded by other factors, which we're going to get to in just a minute. Now, at the time of the attack, uh, U.S. troops were um, armed with uh, Springfield one-shot rifles. Now, that may seem um, insufficient in today's terms, but here was the rationale, and it wasn't ridiculous, and that is, at that time, cavalry didn't fight on horseback. What they did was they rode horseback to where the fight was, then three of them dismounted, while the fourth one took the horses into a safe area, 
And then the soldiers spread out and used firepower, superior firepower, because the Springfields could reach accurately to about 600 yards, okay? And so with that firepower, they could keep everyone back. And as a matter of fact, uh, during the first uh, hour or so of the fight, they did keep the uh, attackers back because of uh, this superior firepower. Now, the Native Americans, the Indians, were armed with uh, 1873 Winchesters, basically, and they um, uh, only had a, a range of about 200 yards. So in terms of the um, a, a fight on a battlefield, if there was not tall grass, the Springfields are going to win the day, especially if you have a spread out line of, of soldiers along a, a, a large area. Uh, however, the difference was on that Montana day, the grass was very deep, and this allowed uh, the Native Americans to sneak up on these uh, soldiers that were standing in a line and pick them off one by one, sometimes with hand-to-hand -hand, uh, combat. And when you go there, you really get the impression of that. One of the most outrageous things about this fight is we all have this picture of how it looked because of Hollywood. And we can see the Indians and they're all dressed in their moccasins and their buckskin and their huge war bonnets and they're dressed to the nines as we would expect uh, Native Americans in a fight with the U.S. Cavalry would look. Every movie portrays it that way. However, before this fight in 1873, Custer had an encounter with hostiles along the Yellowstone and he complained in a written report bitterly that they had trouble uh, delineating between friend and foe because the War Department had issued uh, uh, anglicized clothing to all the Indians on the reservation. And here's a picture of uh, the, the reservation at that time. And look at all the men. They're all dressed. They look like they're in Brooks Brothers suits. So imagine in the battlefield that your enemy and you look over and there's somebody that looks like He's a trooper on, on your side. This was a really key component in the swinging of the fight away. They also, the Indians would use uh, tactics uh, where they would sneak up uh, close to a soldier, and then the first one would jump up and, and immediately go back down. And when the soldier took his rifle over to try to track that uh, hostile, some, the second person would uh, sit up and shoot them. Another uh, aspect of the fight that is very controversial is that uh, the men on Reno Hill, uh, many of whom survived, uh, were reporting about uh, uh, sharpshooters from what's become known as Sharpshooter Ridge. Well, Sharpshooters Ridge was about 600 yards away, and uh, it turns out that the Indians that were there had taken uh, rifles from uh, the Custer troops and brought them to play against the soldiers that were there. And they started picking off um, soldiers and mules and horses one by one. And it was like uh, they believed, the, the troopers believed, in fact, uh, one of the testified that they thought that there was a white person who was a renegade uh, uh, American who was fighting against the Native Americans uh, and was dressed up like an Indian. Now, there was a, a white person found after the fight and this has led to people uh, to believe that uh, he, he was the one who was doing all the shooting. Well, it turns out that that was a little um, I was racist uh, because there was a belief that no Indian could shoot that good. Well, I'm sorry. I don't believe that. However, here's the advantage they had. OK, firing from uh, the east side of Reno Hill and from the west. Uh, the Indians were basically taking their weapons and pointing them skyward and just firing. Now, it, that doesn't sound as willy-nilly as it is because the troops were lined up side by side and, and the Indians were shooting down the line. So any they, they could hit anything along the way. One of the troopers, in fact, we're going to talk about him here in a minute, uh, he, he claimed that his friend was from Milwaukee, was taken off his jacket, and he was hit in the heart and died. And uh, he, uh, Charlie Bidoff, was actually uh, his rifle stock was busted and it saved his life. And uh, so the firing, uh, there was a fire, an actual uh, force fire in 1989 and the uh, archeologists and historians descended upon this area and they found a sniper's nest 
and they discovered like 75 bullets, okay, uh, from a, uh, a Sharps, and there were a whole bunch of Winchester, I think there were 44 of them in, in one position. So the Indi Indians did a real punishing uh, firefight uh, on the on the Reno position, not to mention wiping out everybody in Custer's command, which was about 200 people. Now, another bizarre thing that's, uh, you know, <laughs> the truth is just stranger than anything you could make up. But um, uh, one of the Indian participants, her name was Mary Crawler. She testified that uh, when Custer came down, he was trying to find a place to cross the river and attack the village. And the idea was a pincer movement with Reno coming in from this side and Custer would go all the way around the other side and attack there and they wouldn't stand a chance. Well, that that's, you know, that's just classical pincer uh, West Point, tech, you know, ideas of a uh, strategy. And but he couldn't get across. They went down into Medicine Tail Cooley. And according to Mary Crawler, uh, there was a beaver dam and the beaver dam had uh, made it almost impassable. And so three officers lost their lives at that place. And for a while, it was uh, believed that Custer was killed there and they carried him back up on the ridge where he died. We don't believe that anymore. But here's the bizarre thing. Was Custer done in by a beaver dam? I mean, <laughs> you can't, if I saw that in the movie, I'd go, yeah, that's, that really kind of stretch of things. But it, it's it's true. OK. Uh, another factor that goes back to Custer uh, being so brash is that in his career, which was short but pretty amazing, he had a dozen horses shot out from under him in battle. He was riding his 13th horse that was shot out from under him, and unfortunately, he was a casualty as well. And it really goes back to the old... Uh, of the Carol sayings of your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. So the fact that Custer was so brash is what led to his fame, but the brashness uh, actually uh, his number came up and that number was 13. Well, as Charlie Windolph says in his memoirs, he wrote a memoir called I fought with Custer uh, quote, we caught glimpses of white objects lying along the ridge that led northward. We pulled up our horses. This was the battlefield here. Custer's luck had finally run out. And Charles Windolf, um, he lived until 1950. Think about that. And as a matter of fact, in 1947, one of our friends, one of my friends, the um, esteemed Robert Utley interviewed him when he was working at the Little Bighorn Battlefield as a young man. And fast forward to 2019, I got to interview Robert Utley so think about that. Uh, we're talking about the fight. We're talking about this guy who survived. He was 99 when he died. This is Wendell. Think about that. That's two degrees of Custer and Crazy Horse. And just for your uh, uh, enjoyment, here's a little snippet of that interview, which my partner, Ken Amorosano, took when we visited Robert Utley that fateful day. Uh, Charlie Wendolf was telling me all of these stories. A young kid, 17 years old, an old man, 97 years old, who had actually been in the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Well, in conclusion, here's the bottom line everything that could go wrong did, everything that worked before did not. The tall grass, the Indians all dressed as Anglos, the clothing that they got from the War Department, the supplying of modern weaponry to the Indians, the work of beavers, all right, the incompetence of his subordinates all played into this disaster. I hope this has given you a little better uh, idea of what actually happened in June of 1876. It certainly is an eye opener and I hope you enjoyed it. Hey, if you like this video and wanna see more of that, comment down below, it really helps, okay? And be sure to hit the subscribe button down below and click on the bell next to it. You know, for Bob Bell, click on the bell, okay? <laughs>